If there's ever a time where we needed to pull together as believers of Christ and, and unite and try to strengthen and make the world a better place, it's now. Mm-hmm. And that, that sounds like he's yeah. preaching our message. <laughs> there's one body, one church, one spirit, one hope. The realities of the faith, the realities that unify us are already there. Christ prayed for unity. What should we all be praying for? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's the one prayer request of Jesus. Think about it in the Bible, that we actually have a say in whether or not it comes to fruition or not. I think in what God has done in you guys in, uh, in this podcast and the, the multitude of folks that you're reaching, the diversity, whatever God intended when, he's, when you started this, he's able to bring it to completion. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Whole Church Podcast. I am one of your co-hosts, Joshua Noel, here with your other co-host, the host you like the most, TJ Tiberius Juan Blackwell. Hello. How are you doing today, TJ? All right, guys. Well, that was today's episode. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Today, we'll, we actually got a lot to talk about. Um, we're going to be going over the first three verses of Genesis 12. So we've made it three verses further since the last episode in this series. We've also named the series since the last time we had an episode that was part of this series. And it is now named the Dividing Scripture Series. So we're excited about that. We're going to be jumping into those first three verses. We're going to be talking about religious arrogance. We're going to be talking about some of the history of the church, how we define the church. We're going to get to hear from our think tank, and you're going to get to hear TJ's favorite black theologian or church leader. Just mine. I'll probably do it too. Hmm. But before we do, we want to review some of what our audience has been up to lately, as well as throw in a quick reminder, provided TJ allows it. He's the boss, so you know. Uh, So recently, we asked people on our social media when they go into work. So we had three people tell us they go into work at 8 a.m. One person goes to work at 9 a.m. One person starts the second shift. Two people said other. And one person says varies, and that was Father Jonathan, who then explained that as ministers, never really off the clock. So it's hard to say. Hmm. You know, just as the needs of his people arise, that's when he works. Makes sense to me. Yeah. And then uh, when we asked everyone... Who they would fight of any arcade game villain. TJ's mom, Don Blackwell, and my wife, Tiffany Lucas, both said the same thing on different platforms. They said they would fight the ghost from Pac-Man, which I just say good luck. Because I don't know where you find that little ball that allows you to eat them, so. Good luck. And Diana said King Koopa, which is very similar to my answer, Koopa Troopa, because she was like, you know, in real life, he's a turtle, so maybe he'll be slow. No, King Koopa is Bowser. Really? Yes. I mean, Bowser's still a turtle. Mm, kind of. Not really. Well, Diana, good luck. <laughs> um, and then that reminder, TJ's not stopping me, so I'm going to let you guys know. We did just switch to a new hosting site, which um, Captivate, for those of you who are interested, which gives us our own website you can check out. All that kind of stuff should be in the show notes. The, really, the only reason it's important to you all is... It may have messed up your subscription, so just double check. Make sure you're still subscribed to the podcast. Wherever you're listening right now, go to the top of the page, see if it says subscribe. If it doesn't, hit it. And then if you weren't subscribed previously, you are now. So that's cool. Right. So today's silly question, which, of course, we're still going to do. What is your third favorite reptile? I'm very prepared for this. Yeah, you wrote the question. Yeah. Yeah. I'm also very always prepared to answer. You know why I use this question? Uh, A teacher on my Facebook timeline said that's why they like children is because adults never ask you what's your third favorite reptile. So then I said, you know what? I will ask everyone what is their third favorite reptile. So for me, my favorite reptile and favorite animal period is the sea turtle. All of them. That wasn't the question. What? I thought it was third favorite reptile. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'm getting to it. Second would be the giant tortoise. So then third would be the box turtle. It says just the third. Well, I was building up to it, you know? My third favorite reptile is Godzilla. (laughs) Wait, who's your first favorite reptile? Doesn't matter. Not the question. (laughs) I don't think Godzilla is real. That's your mistake. (laughs) All right. Well, uh, before... It's an iguana. <laughs> your favorite or your third? Godzilla. My third favorite is a Galapagos uh, iguana. 
I thought you were telling me that Godzilla wasn't a guano. But he pretty much is. That's a different podcast episode, though. But we could talk about it. Well, that being said, we are sponsored by absolutely no one, but we wish we were sponsored by King Kong vs. Godzilla. Yeah, we're sponsored by Legendary Pictures. <laughs> All right. So before we jump into the real stuff, we did want to remind everyone the point of this series. Again, Dividing Scripture series. And in the show notes, I'm going to have a link to a playlist that has every episode in this series. So go check that out. Pretty cool stuff. Um, Yeah. So this series goal is to see where the church can have unity despite all of its disagreements. Sometimes we're going to have to accept that you can't have Christian unity. You can still have unity, but not Christian unity, because if you don't accept some things, you can't be a Christian. We're going to see some of that in today's topic. And when we do face those kind of situations, it's important that we remember Romans 12. Not Romans 12. Romans 12, 18, which says that we should strive to maintain peace with everyone. Even non-believers. So even when we come across someone where if they believe that they can't be Christian, we are still supposed to find peace with them somehow, some way. Um, today, we're only going to give our personal views and in this segment when we think it's appropriate or necessary. Because um, our goal really isn't to settle any arguments, but rather to look past the arguments to see how we can have true Christian unity. So that being said, uh, let's jump into things. Yeah. Uh, so we just wanted to start with the scripture today. Uh, Crazy. Why would you do that? Mm-hmm. Genesis 12, 1 through 3 uh, says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you, and I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And I and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Yeah, this kind of opens up a new, ironically, a new chapter in the Bible. You know, not just because of chapter 12, but because Genesis 1 through 11 was telling one story. And now we're beginning a different story. in Genesis 12 dealing with the patriarchs of Israel. So if you want to kind of hear a summed up our thoughts and that kind of stuff for Genesis one through 11 in that chapter, go back to episode 70. And that's kind of where we wrap up the first part of Genesis. Now, starting with this new set section, what we're looking at specifically, we want to look at the promise to Abraham that all families of the earth are going to be blessed through him. As Christians, we know that that is a prophecy of Jesus death and resurrection. Because Jesus was from Abraham's lineage, and through Jesus, all families of the earth, all nations of the earth can be saved. St. Paul makes this clear in Galatians 3, 6 through 9. Uh, Which reads, Just as Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, therefore recognize that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All the nations will be blessed in you. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. Uh, God gave Abram this promise conditionally. God said, Go and I will make you. Uh, God was saying, By your faith in doing this, I will accomplish my goals. Uh, Now today, through faith, we become children of Abraham. Would you now please sing that song? I don't know that song. You know, Father Abraham? Oh, that song. Amen, Isa? No. I mean, I was asking our listeners. Oh. I was going to just give them a time to sing. Hmm. Okay, thank you listeners for that. Um, <laughs> so now we're going to move on to how this promise affected people later on in the Bible. Of course, it had plenty of positive effects on the people, knowing that they were the people of God. But also, some people use it as an excuse for a religious or a national arrogance. So in the Old Testament, throughout the Bible, we kind of see the people of Israel displaying this type of arrogance. Um, specifically, if you look at Genesis through Deuteronomy, you're going to see a lot of times when God's talking to his people, he's saying, hey, hey, remember, I delivered you. So when people come to you, you treat them the same way. Which, you know, he wouldn't say that if they were already doing that. So clearly they were kind of saying, we're God's people. You don't belong with us. And God's saying, that's just not how it works. You treat the outsiders the same way I treated you. 
And, you know, you see the laws, a lot of them pertaining to how they reach out to other people. A lot of the Psalms talk about how God's people are a light to everyone. And yet you continue to see this kind of pride in the people of Israel in the Old Testament of the Bible. And they're often punished for it. And it even kind of goes into the New Testament. You know, in the New Testament, the apostles make it clear that this arrogance kind of continues with the people of Israel. And even Jesus, we're going to talk some about that later, ironically displays this kind of religious arrogance that a lot of the other Jewish people show. We're going to see that when we talk about Jesus and the Canaanite woman later on. But there was also an arrogance, even as early on as the Bible was written, that first century Christianity, from the Christians towards the people of Israel. Um, a really good example of this is found in Romans 11, 17 through 26. Mm -hmm. And uh, that says, But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive, were grafted in among them and became partaker with them of the rich root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. But if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Uh, quite right. They were broken off for their unbelief. But you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. See then the kindness and severity of God. To those who fell, severity, but to you, God's kindness. If you continue in his kindness, for otherwise you too will be cut off. Uh, and they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree, and contrary to nature were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree. For I do not want you, brothers and sisters, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and so all Israel will be saved. That last part really tricks some people up. All Israel will be saved. Mm -hmm. I'll just kind of put a, put a footnote there, and we'll get back to it. For now, I kind of want to break down what TJ just read. So basically, when you're hearing this all this about the tree, when the Bible's talking about the roots of the olive tree, it's talking about the patriarch. So that's going to be what we're talking about the next little while in this series, starting with Abraham. So you have Abraham, you have Isaac, Jacob, Israel, Joseph, so on. Those are the roots of the, quote, olive tree in this scripture, right? Then the natural branches are then the people of Israel who started to not believe in Jesus. They didn't believe in God. They were falling away. As such, God kind of said, okay, enough with you, sent his son, and now salvation is open to everyone. I, a Gentile, can just be put into this tree. So I am a branch from a wild olive tree that is grafted into the other tree. This tree is basically just salvation, if you will. So... That's why Jesus had to be of Jewish descent, because he had to come from the tree so that we could be grafted in through him. So what Paul's saying here is that God has not forsaken Israel, but still has a special place for them who choose to return to him through Christ. All others who are not of Jewish descent are now able to be grafted in as well. So it's significant that Paul claims, which we already said this, that all Israel will be saved. So we'll just put a footnote in that. There is a lot of debate on what that means. Um, most likely, there's going to be a huge influx of people of Israel coming to Christ and choosing salvation in the last days. All that being said, unfortunately, the arrogance of those of the church, which we talked about, why Paul is writing this, was the people in the church were saying, we're saved and you're not, nee, 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 kind of making fun of the people of Israel saying, now we have salvation. It's not just yours anymore. Unfortunately, that arrogance kind of continues, and the arrogance back continued as well, where the Jewish people are like, we're the people of God, not you guys. And we're going to see that all throughout church history, and it's going to do lasting damage to the church. It's going to cause lots of splits. It's one of the absolute worst things, perhaps the worst thing to happen to church unity, is just that kind of religious 
arrogance. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so that kind of brings us to the subject of race. Uh, And as we continue to go through the Bible, the people of Israel will use their special place in God's heart to exclude people of other nations and races. Uh, We see this in the story of Jonah and the Ninevites uh, throughout the book of Isaiah and both in the parables of Jesus and his witty rhetoric with the Canaanite woman in Matthew 15, 25 through 28. Yeah, so we told you guys we were going to read this scripture. And um, Jesus is ironically displaying the kind of arrogance that the people of Israel showed towards others in the scripture, right? So let me go ahead and read this. But she, the Canaanite woman, came, knelt before him, Jesus, and said, Lord, help me. Jesus answered, it isn't right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus replied to, the, to her, Woman, your faith is great. Let it be done for you as you want. Just crazy that, that that's just how the people of Israel talked to the other people. They called them dogs. And Jesus was kind of using that to test, you know, if she was still treated this way, would she still believe? And in this case, she did. And he said, Hey, your faith made you good. But that's the kind of racism we see from the people of Israel at that time. Very damaging. I'm going to talk about more of how racism and that kind of stuff falls in the church later on. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, you know, we're coming up. We have reached our think tank segment. Uh, You know, it's just where we review some of the discussions we've been having about today's topics with leaders from all sorts of denominations, from, you know, Pentecostal, Orthodox, Catholic, Anglican, you know, what have you. Uh, just that we have a group of on Facebook that, that we've met through this podcast. Uh, the about 30 church leaders are in the group, largely previous guests of the show, uh, and a couple future guests of the show, and uh, one or two people who we really do not know, but came highly recommended. Uh, so yeah. when asked about their opinion concerning the relationship of the people of Israel and the church today, uh, four people voted that. Anyone saved today is grafted in as a part of Israel with all their covenants and promises left standing. Uh, One person voted that Christ's death opened up atonement to all, but Israel still has some land promises from God that will be fulfilled in the end. Uh, Reverend Lanclos explained that the land covenants were merely signs to show when Christ would be coming. The land itself was not the promise, but simply a sign. And uh, William Lovett explained his commitment to the Westminster Confession of Faith. He quoted, Beside this law, commonly called moral, God was pleased to give to the number God was pleased to give to the people of Israel as a church under age, ceremonial laws, containing several types of ordinances, partly of worship, prefiguring Christ, his graces, actions, sufferings, and benefits, and partly holding forth divers instructions of moral duties. All which ceremonial laws are now abrogated under the New Testament. So, certainly some things to say. Uh, When asked to define the church, our group came up with this definition. Uh, The assembly of those who are in Christ, God's people, everywhere and for all time. Yeah, naturally not everyone agrees with that definition, but that's by large consensus. By and large. Yeah. Um, so when asked when the church was founded, like at what point did the church, you missed my air quotes, the church was founded. Um, three people said that the church started at Pentecost, the moment that the Holy Spirit came down onto the disciples and empowered them. Uh, two people said with Abraham at the point of the promise that we're reading about today. One person said with Jesus. You know, Jesus. And one person said other. Right. Yeah. That person, future pod. Well, uh, Niles Merritt, future guest. Yeah. Uh, engages with us a lot. Uh, yeah. Voted Jesus. He explains that if we divine, define church as all believers in Christ, then it had to start with him. Yeah. You I mean, know? pretty straightforward. Uh, to which, you know, Father Jonathan 
jokingly explained, you know, Father Jonathan, we've had him on the show. Yeah. Uh, Orthodox guy. priest. Uh, yeah. Greek Orthodox. Yeah. He's the one who voted other. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, he jokingly explained, I had a professor who said it was when there was a debate over who should replace Judas. Because what's the church without church politics? Uh, <laughs> tongue in cheek, of course, but it's got us questioning our priorities. Then gave his real explanation that the church is the eternal manifestation of the kingdom of God, so it has its beginnings with eternity. In a conversation with Dr. Keith Sherlin for the Think Tank, he explained that his theology as an Emeraldian Emeraldian sort of sidesteps the issues, but we should look at the theologies of replacement theology and dispensationalism. I can't talk today. (laughs) <laughs> as major parts of this conversation, uh, replacement theology states that the new church will replace Israel as God's people, whereas dispensationalists believe that Christ is now the only way to salvation. But there are still outstanding promises to the people of Israel as God's people. Yeah, which we will talk more about that later. It was a good suggestion to look at those theologies. Um, when asked specifically about the significance of Genesis 12, 1 through 3, to today's church, Uh, Niles Merritt and William Lovett both agree that this promise is significant because the church is the fulfillment of the promise that all nations would be blessed through Abraham, which we said earlier. Mm -hmm. Uh, Then we asked about the 144,000 Israeli people in Revelations who were sealed and saved in the end times. Uh, Three people voted that this is actually a representation of all God's people. Uh, We had one person vote that this is a picture of the church as the new Israel. And one person voted that these are Jewish ministers in the end times that God sent to preach the gospel to his chosen people. And uh, finally, we asked the group to come up with a statement about racism. Uh, Here's what they came up with. Uh, We are all made in the image of God. To dishonor another person based on race is to dishonor God himself. Wow. Uh, That's that's a good one. That's pretty much all we have for the monthly think tank segment. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I've been asked before why we do that. And uh, pretty much the short answer is if we're going to be talking about the whole church, it's helpful to hear all the different opinions of the whole church. And it's helpful for us to see people talking about these other opinions from different churches civilly. Because, you know, that is a form of unity, disagreeing civilly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so that means that we're going to jump into the part where we're actually talking about how the scripture has been a divisive issue throughout the years. You know, this is our dividing scripture series. It's, an, it's a natural thing we should talk about. Um, but I do need to be a little bit transparent with everybody because um, TJ called me out on it. <laughs> but uh, there, this section of scripture really didn't have that much divisive issues throughout history. But there were some. And since we're going to be talking a lot about Black History Month, Black, Black History this month, as part of Black History Month, I thought it was just appropriate to talk about the section of scripture that does touch on the issue of racial equality and religious arrogance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but before we do that, uh, let's read our scripture once again. Uh, now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Amen and amen. Right. Now, let's say our prayers. Um, I do really like that, that, that particular scripture, but we're not preaching today. We're just talking about how arguments have happened about this. So um, specifically, uh, some of the church, as we've mentioned earlier, has argued about the place that Israel has today because of this promise, right? God promised Abraham this about his descendants, that they will be blessed and those who curse them will be cursed. So the church has argued over what is God's place for Israel today. We mentioned some of these arguments in our Think Tank segment already, but we kind of want to dig a little bit deeper into how we can have unity and disagree on these topics. Um, so again, uh, we mentioned replacement th- theology and dispensationalist or dispensationalism. 
Um, the replacement theology is just the belief that the church is the new Israel, replaces the old Israel. So all of God's promises, like this one, that we will be blessed and those who curse us will be cursed. We get all those because we're Israel now, not Israel. Uh, dispensationalism is just sort of a both and belief. It's that we have salvation only through Christ. You can only get into heaven. You can only have true salvation, be part of the kingdom of God through Christ. But there's also all of these promises that those who bless Israel will be blessed, that those who curse Israel will be cursed. All of these promises still stand. Israel still has a special place for God. If, you know, I know there's some controversy if America counts as a Christian nation or not, but let's just presume that we're a Christian nation and we do something to offend Israel. Dispensationalists would then say that God would then do something to offend us because God still has a special place for Israel. Which kind of leads us into the argument over the 144,000 people in the book of Revelation. Because, because some people don't believe God still has that special place for Israel and that the church is now Israel. And some people still believe that salvation is only through Christ, but God still has these promises to Israel. So we have kind of varying definitions of what Israel means in the New Testament, ironically enough. Because of that, when the book of Revelations talks about a special group of 144,000 Israeli people who are sealed to be saved in the end times, some people say, no, by Israel, he means the church. Some people say, you know, a, a lot of different things. Before we get in, um, probably want to read some of these verses. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you said that they are mentioned three times in the book of Revelations. Uh, the first time is in Revelation 7, 3 through 8, uh, which reads, don't harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we seal the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000, sealed from every tribe of the Israelites. The passage continues, listing that there is 12,000 from each tribe of Israel. You know, go check it out. Yeah, 12 uh, times 12,000, mm -hmm. 144,000. Uh, there are several arguments about who this number really represents. The most obvious is the literalist argument that it is just 144,000 people from the nation of Israel. Yeah. If, yeah. Uh, if our friend Pastor Chris would have voted earlier, that he would have said, said that. that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, a lot of arguments revolve around the symbolism of the number 12. Uh, 12 represents completion in the Hebrew ideology. Uh, so this is 12 times 12, also known as complete fullness. Uh, some use this to say that it is symbolic of when God has gathered all the Israel people of the time. Some say it symbolizes all of God's people throughout all time. Uh, some say it's the complete church, which, you know, that would be nice. Uh, you know, the whole church. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. But none of these arguments impact salvation. Only what our role will be in the end times, which, if we obey God, won't really matter. Uh, we will just do as we are told in the end. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter what we think those people are. Mm -hmm. If it's us, God will let us know. And if it's not, right, we'll, we'll find out. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> so that's, that's an argument. That most of those arguments don't affect church unity, right? Because we can still be saved and believe different things and continue on with our lives. There is one argument about the text that I do, that I do think excludes salvation. And thus, I think people who hold to this argument, I can't consider Christian. So we, I can't have Christian unity with, and that's going to be the belief of the Jehovah witnesses. What they believe is that this number is the number of people who are the elect. So only 144,000 people will be saved according to the Jehovah witnesses. And they will all be, of course, Jehovah witnesses. So by limiting the number of people who can be saved and by another belief that they have that there is no hell, they undermine the power of the cross and the need for salvation. So those are the reasons why I don't believe I can have Christian unity with people who are members of the Jehovah Witnesses. But I will say, I'm open to being wrong. Uh, if someone's listening, knows a Jehovah Witness or is a Jehovah Witness, wants to be on the podcast, reach out. I'll be glad to have this argument with you and be proven wrong and have a great Christian unity with you once I am. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that just be insane? That'd be fantastic. Uh, no, no, no. Just the fact that only 144,000 people can get saved. Yeah. God made billions and billions. It was like... These are the ones I the, like. The, the population of the world has been over 1 billion people since like 1808. Yeah. More people live in California right now than they probably did in the world at 
some point 2000 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. If what I understand to be their belief is correct, I think it's absolutely absurd. Yeah. Yeah. Cause there's, there's definitely been more than 144,000 Jehovah witnesses also. Mm-hmm. Just, just, in, just, I just don't understand it. I don't want to call it crazy or anything. I just don't understand it. Mm-hmm. But, uh, if it is what it says it is, and it's excluding everyone but 144,000 people from salvation, I have a problem with that. Anyway, so now we're going to talk about some of the issues specifically dealing with who is the church. You know, we talked about earlier, a lot of people say that the church started with Abraham. Um, and a lot of people have argued about even how to define church, right? And we want to talk about how the church has also fallen into this kind of religious arrogance that we've saw from the Israeli people from this promise. Um, so for this section, we're largely going to be pulling from Greg Allison or Dr. Greg Allison's book of historical theology, um, which we will have him on the podcast later on this year. Right. Uh, so I wanted to start with the early church because, you know, that makes the most sense. Yeah. Uh, early on in the church, there was much debate in how to define church. Uh, Clement of Alexandria claimed that the church was visible by its mark of unity. Uh, Hippolytus further explained it must also be marked by its holiness. Uh, Hippolytus was concerned that the people will claim they are part of the church, but continue in shameless acts. No one would ever do that, right? Never. (laughs) Also, Hippolytus claims to have seen dragons. Also, cool name. Yeah, I just Probably possibly my favorite church father name. I just wanted to put that out there. Yeah, cool Hippolytus said he saw dragons. Yeah. So you mentioned that um, Clement of Alexandria said that the mark of what the church is is unity. Would you think that would you know whole church podcast? We mm-hmm. love Clement of Alexandria, but he also crossed a very important line, and he put the church on a certain trajectory for a long time that it, it took a very long time for the church to get out of. That line he crossed was that he claimed that. Anyone who wasn't uh, physically attending a church service with a congregation is proven to be arrogant and thus has removed themselves from the church, cannot have salvation because they are not part of the church. And thus decided that attendance to church is necessary for salvation. A few episodes back, we talked with Eric Nevins. I believe that was episode 69. It was the last episode of last year. He explained that anyone who excludes people from the church is the enemy to church unity. Now, I do want to pause here and say that doesn't mean we're saying that Clement of Alexandria or anyone else who did that we're going to talk about aren't Christians, but it does mean that they significantly impacted our ability to have unity in the church. All of a sudden, anyone who wasn't able to attend a physical church was no longer saved. That was a terrible offense to church unity. Um, So we're just kind of talking about that not necessarily the person themselves but that specific thing did affect church unity negatively um so we move on fast forward a few hundred years or something uh saint augustine was the first to significantly broaden the definition of the church i really like saint augustine's definition it's probably how i talk about the church he claims that anyone who's redeemed from adam all the way until eternity anyone ever in all time is part of the church the true church Um, He expounded on that. He said that even angels are counted as part of the church because they are redeemed, redeemed creatures. Um, So he even went on and he made the distinction. This is the part that I really liked. He made the distinction between the visible church and the true church. So there were a lot of people who were part of the visible church who were not redeemed. They were false members. That's what he would call them. And then there's the true church of all the people who are redeemed. And that, that's an important thing. You know, we jokingly just talked about that earlier. You know, that people in the church would do bad things. Oh, no. It's true. There are false members, people who should go to church services, but aren't part of the true church. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that brings us to the Middle Ages and uh, filioque, which I cannot believe it's said like that. I looked it up. <laughs> but it's filioque. I got a question for you. Mm-hmm. Would you believe that I had you read this part because I didn't know how to say it? Yes. Okay. Uh, The church is is close tied to Rome and its prominence in the state would lead to much religious arrogance. Uh, When Rome fell, the church was so distraught that it referred to this time as the Dark Ages. Uh, It was around the time, around this time, of supreme arrogance that the church went through its first major split. 
Yeah. Uh, the split was because of a theological issue over the filioque clause uh, being added to the Nicene Creed. Uh, this doesn't directly relate to today's topic, so we will just take a moment to explain what happened. Uh, the Pope added a phrase to the Nicene Creed that says the Holy Spirit proceeds from both the Father and the Son. The phrase was added, the phrase added was, and the Son. Mm -hmm. uh, the Orthodox Church could not agree with the adding of this phrase as it was not in the already confirmed councils of Nicaea and Constantinople. The split occurred because the Western Church believed the Pope had the authority to add the clause and the Eastern Church believed in no such authority. The Eastern Church also believed that if the Spirit came from both God and His Son, then that undermines God's role as the sender. The Catholic Church maintained the Spirit had to come from both, or else Christ's death had no authority to bestow the Spirit on believers. Yeah, pretty big deal. Hey guys, we just wanted to take a quick break to tell you a few ways that you can support the Whole Church Podcast, your favorite Church Unity podcast. Yeah, so you can sign up for our newsletter at our website or by emailing us at thewholechurch at gmail.com. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. You could share this episode on your own social media. You could donate to us on Cash App with the tag that's in the show notes. You could follow us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash the Whole Church Podcast. You can subscribe to this show wherever great podcasts are found, or you could rate us on Apple Podcasts or Podchasers. Especially that last one. It's a really great way for us to get recognition, not only from the community, but from people looking to find new good podcasts. Yeah. So let's get back to the show then. Yeah. There were two other important saints in the development of Church Today from the Middle Ages. <laughs> that we need to discuss Thomas Aquinas and John Wycliffe Thomas Aquinas was tarred and feathered in constant oh that's not what it said <laughs> yeah TJ doesn't like no yeah <laughs> Thomas Aquinas both argued that separating from the Catholic Church is heresy and that heretics should be sentenced to death he justified this because People who committed fraud over money were sentenced to death, and heresy is an even bigger fraud. He may not have tied these two ideas together directly, but it seems likely that he believed anyone who said they were part of the church and was not attending a Catholic church should be placed to death. Yeah, that's a pretty big deal. Mm -hmm. Is that why you don't like him? No. Is it part? Good reason, though. <laughs> uh, John Wycliffe, one of the reformers, claimed publicly that attendance of the church could not guarantee salvation even for the pope. He even called the Pope the Antichrist at one point. Uh, you know, they killed Pretty people for language. a lot less back then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the backlash to this evil being done in the Catholic Church led to another church split with the Protestants. The Catholic Church had its empire and the Lutheran reformed, started by Wycliffe, and Anglican churches became the magisterial churches. Yeah, which I, I do want to just throw in there really real, real quick. Part of this national religious arrogance that we're talking about right here is also how we get captain henry morgan coming along uh, his family had a lot to do with the anglo-spanish wars where the anglican church was kind of trying to force itself on the spanish nation and they were like oh wait a minute we want to be part of this other church and from that war he was granted the status of a privateer and eventually became possibly the world's best known pirate so i got to throw in pirate history today i'm very excited that is not that's just not true though it's it Blackbeard. No. Uh, well, okay. Yes. Yeah. I said one of the. I didn't say the. You said possibly the. It is possible. No, it isn't. Okay. We don't know a lot about Blackbeard for him to be relevant in this. Makes me upset. We don't know. I mean, he could have been from the Anglo. Okay, anyway. Um, so after a lot of splits, and there have been plenty, and we just mentioned a few here. Most of them do have to do with this kind of religious arrogance. A lot of the times, it's that arrogance happened because the church got tied with the state and had a lot of power and was afraid of losing that power. But uh, there have been a few revivals and different things that brought churches back together. Uh, one of them, which I feel obligated to mention, was the Pentecostal movement. You know, me and TJ are both part of the Pentecostal church, so it makes us happy to be able to do that. Uh, so here's a quote from Greg Allison's book. 
He says Baptists, Lutherans, Methodists, Anglicans, even Roman Catholics claimed renewal through Pentecostal theology, typified by enthusiastic devotion to Christ. This has contributed to the greatest expansion of the church in history. Typified. Is that not what I said? Typified. What I say? Typified. It's typified. Okay, okay yeah. I see. Okay, so, <laughs> not, so America today, churches play an important role in our nation now, which you see if you paid any attention to politics at all, pretty much. Um, every time the church has been caught up in the state politics, it's come, it's become arrogant with power and has begun to split. So this should be a warning for us today, something that we should look at and truly consider when we consider the church today. Mm -hmm. uh, so to summarize, anyone who excludes people unnecessarily from the church are enemies of church unity. We can believe either that the Holy Spirit came from God the Father alone or from him, from him and Christ. Uh, this disagreement may lead to us attending separate churches, but if we can agree that salvation is through the Son's sacrifice, and that by accepting Jesus in your heart, the Holy Spirit resides in you, then we can still have church unity, which is what the Orthodox and Catholic churches have come to terms with today. And arrogance in the church is what leads to church splits. This often comes when the church gets too involved with the state too closely. So we must be careful not to get too arrogant in our place as God's people. Good summary. Thanks. I didn't write it. <laughs> All right. So it's Black History Month, as I've already mentioned. Um, and since we've discussed race today, and since we're asking most of our other guests this month to do this, I think we should also tell our listeners who our favorite black theologian and Christian leaders are. Would you like to go first, TJ? Nope. Would you like me to go first, TJ? Sure. All right. So um, I I'm actually going to go with Connie Matthews Hershaw. She is the president currently of the historic First Baptist Church of Williamsburg, and she was the first president of the National Capital Planning Committee. She has a lot to do with American politics, has worked with people from both parties across the, you know, the lines there. Um, but the reason I list her as my favorite is actually because of her role with the First Baptist Church of Williamsburg. Um, currently in Williamsburg, she is leading an archaeological expedition, digging up the first Baptist African-American church. Um, it was the church who was pastored by Goen Pamphlet, who was ordained in 1772. He was the first African-American pastor in America, um, who, just as a fun fact, his master was the one who let him go get ordained and helped him start the church, and her son set him free. So, you know, it's just a fun fact, but uh, they're, they're digging up this church. They're discovering a lot of things about the black church early on in America. And we're learning a lot just from just, you know, candles and different things that were there that showed us that's what the church was like for them at that time. And I don't know. It, it's incredible. I'm really fascinated by archaeology in general um, and her dedication to what a lot of people thought was irrelevant. You know, just 40 years ago, they paved over that in a parking lot. And she came along and said, no, I think this might be important. And it turned out she was right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, hats off to you, Connie. We appreciate you. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. It's really one of those things that you see in a sitcom where it's like, oh, they can't get rid of our park. I love this park. And then they find out like one of the trees is like two and a half thousand years old or. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They built the main stage around it at the first town hall or something ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I really thought you were just about to describe Parks Direct for a second. No. Yeah, let me just explain the entire thing. I did show. kind of do that. Yeah. But uh, favorite black theologian. Uh, this was harder to come up with than I thought it would be because, you know, when you're learning about people in the church, it's not something you notice really. Like, oh, yeah. they're black. Very seldomly, I feel like we get pictures or told about that kind of stuff. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. Like, I, I really didn't know. I know Martin Luther. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know Connie. <laughs> I didn't know her last name, though. But uh, ironically, uh, my favorite black theologian uh, is Michael Curry, who is currently uh, the archbishop of and primate of the Episcopal Church in America, which is a huge deal. First African-American you know, archbishop of the Episcopal Church America. Uh, but, you know, the reason he's my favorite is mostly because he's from, well, he's from Chicago, 
but uh, he was the presiding bishop over the diocese of North Carolina, which is like right here, yeah, right here, sort of our whole thing, at least at the beginning. <laughs> and uh, really, the reason he's my favorite, basically, the first thing he did when he was elected, chosen, I guess, <laughs> uh, as presiding bishop was. He immediately removed people in, you know, like the upper echelons of the church who had allegations. He was like, yeah, that's not, I don't care if you did it or not. You can't have that image and be with our church. So, yeah, yeah, something in the Bible about being above reproach or something, mm -hmm. or yeah. holding the very image of evil, mm -hmm. something like that. It's mentioned a few times. Yeah. yeah. But like he just did it immediately. So, you know, I just thought it was dope. He's also big into a revival. He had revival stores for the Episcopal Church and we're not Episcopalian, but, you know, kind we of do thing. like revivals. Yeah, <laughs> we do like revival. But, uh, you know, it's just really cool. Really dope guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, so that being said, um, you, we always like to leave our audience with something practical and tangible that they could go and do right now. Something that will help them help us maintain church unity for the whole church. Um, so this this week, we're, we want to ask everybody to look up one black church leader that you might not know a lot about and just learn something. Doesn't matter what, just learn something. I, I believe if we do this, because, you know, I, kn I know TJ was going to ask what I thought would happen if we all did that. If we do this, I think we'll see everyone understanding the value of different parts of the church We'll, under, we'll become familiar with things that maybe we weren't so familiar with. Imagine if we all began to appreciate all of the church and how it came to be and all of these backstories. I think this understanding would bring us all closer together in unity because understanding people's stories usually helps you come together better. Yeah. Mm, wow. We hope our time today has helped each of us to understand others' beliefs that are different from our own and brought us all closer together in Christian unity than ever before. And uh, we're going to get right into our God Moment segment, which is, you know, just a segment where we share something God has done with us recently, whether it be a challenge or a curse or a moment of worship. Not a curse. Don't get cursed. <laughs> or a blessing. Uh, so, Josh, do you want to go first? I don't have a choice, so sure. Yeah. Yeah, you're the boss. Um, Mine's going to be done again. Uh, I don't remember. I don't know if any of our listeners remember. But a while back, it's probably been months now. Um, my God moment was that I was challenged to say what less often because I have a coworker and it really got on his nerves. And I want to do the best to be a great witness to everyone around me, including him. And I don't want to offend my brother. So I was like, okay, I'm going to try to say what less. And uh, I've been noticing in the last week that it, a lot of times I'll see, you know, I'll say, I'm sorry, or could you repeat that instead of just saying what? And uh, it seems to bother him slightly less. So I'm proud of myself. Still not great at listening, though. Nah, I'm I'm just, I can't hear, man. Mm -hmm. uh, my God moment is that the Mighty Ducks is getting a new series. Let's go. Podcast over. Wait, 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 wait. Repeat that. The Mighty Ducks is getting a new series. Like cartoon series or like? I don't know. I haven't clicked the notification yet. <laughs> I just God. got it while we were recording. <laughs> I was like, yeah, uh, for those it. who don't know, what are the Mighty Ducks? Mighty Ducks is a, a series of some fantastic hockey movies. Also, there's an animated series that is literally ducks there. You don't like the animated series? It's about hockey. Watch it. First movie's fantastic. The other two movies are pretty good. Yeah. Watch them all. All right. So that being said, um, I remind everyone where you can find us. Uh, obviously, wherever you're listening, you can find us there or wherever good podcasts are found. Um, you can find us on pretty much any social media other than like LinkedIn and TikTok. You know, the main ones, you can find us there. Um, you can join our newsletter by emailing us at thewholechurch at gmail.com. Just let us know. Or you can go to our website, which is thewholechurch.captivate.fm. And you can join it that way. You can also follow us on Patreon. And uh, you can get some special exclusive stuff that way. Uh, some future guests for the podcast. We're going to have Paul Calcote of the Real People Real Talk podcast. Reverend Keno Kennedy and Sister Sylvia Staten, uh, Pastor J.R. Martin, and of course, at the end of the season, we're going to have Francis Chan. Wow. Does mm -hmm. he know? I hope not. Yeah, he, he doesn't know. But it's fine. It won't be an obstacle that he doesn't know. Mm -hmm. 
is going to happen.